This is our 13th lesson on the flood, the biblical flood. And uh, what we're doing is we're going through the revised edition of my book. And we're in chapter five. And we hopefully will finish chapter five next week. And it will be in chapter six. We'll be starting back in January. All right. I look at the geologic column right now. This is a, a uh, in the ideas of the atheist, they, they have an interesting uh, arrangement for it. What they st said here, and here's a fellow named Rob, he's an atheist. Uh, he wrote this. He's kind of making fun of, uh, of what are called creationists, people who believe in creation, and uh, particularly those who believe in a, in a global flood. He's, he wrote here an interesting irony in this whole business is that the creationists accept as fact the mistaken notion that the geologic record shows a progression from simple to complex organisms. Well, that's exactly what they depict with it, see? And he says that's a mistaken notion. Well, it does. Faced with the problem of reconciling this presumed sequence of rapid deposition by the flood, the creationists developed a painful explanation of a sequence. Large mammals floated to the surface of the flood sea, complex and therefore more mobile and intelligent animals were able to escape to higher ground and so on. Well, uh, first of all, he's, he's uh, setting up what I call a, a, uh, a straw man. Uh, that's not the view I take, and I don't think a lot of your uh, creationists, even those that have a different view on uh, how the flood occurred, uh, I don't think they he's uh, de depicting or uh, properly representing their position. He's not, not representing it properly. He says, so the creationists have fit essentially false information into their model. Something that would have been quite ne necessary had they read the geological literature more carefully. In other words, it's their fault because they're not, they're just dumb, they're ignorant. And that's what his uh, claim is. The supposed geologic column that he's talking about, let's go back here. The irony of the business that geologic records say appear at geologic record, and that's called the geologic column, geologic col column. It doesn't really exist anywhere on the earth. If we look, here is, here's some other problems with it. And we're going to look at the column in just a moment, but they have other problems. If we had a, a flat lake and water was going in or and uh, something was relatively flat, we get layers of sediment placed upon it. We're looking at sedimentary rock and other rock as well. Not all rock sedimentary, but uh, what we have here, we'd have layer A would be the bottom layer, B would be the second C and D and then as we go up. Uh, there is a rule that says the younger, the less aged, the older stuff will be on the bottom and the younger stuff will be on top. Now that makes perfectly good sense to me. All right. And that, that's one of their rules that so we'll get to that name of that rule a little bit later on. But that's a, one of their rules. We have another problem here. If we're putting sediment in a lake, it's, and it, it was level like this, uh, that would be kind of normal. But what we have here is we get some of this times this sediment gets deformed. We get a deformation, deformation, so it deforms. Now here's the problem with this. If we take rigid rock, and let's say A, B, C, and D are deposited over millions of years of time, the rock will harden and become rigid by concrete. And I tell you what, if you try to bend concrete, it won't bend, it'll, it'll shatter. Same happens with your rocks. So our problem is the atheist with his model, he can't explain. Now, I understand the failure to explain doesn't mean that my position is right, but it means he has a flaw in his system. He can't explain how these rigid rocks got bent like this. So we're going to show some pictures of some of this. And this is called a def deformation, so it deforms. Something pushed up on it and the rocks bent. Now, you don't take rigid rocks and bend them. Uh, if you've had a course in strength of materials or something like that, engineering or equivalent course in physics, 
Uh, you just can't bend rocks. They'll shatter. Under, if you put enough pressure on them, they'll eventually break and just shatter. And these rocks haven't shattered. They're bent. But if they were bent while they were still kind of fluid, and this flood deposited over a period very quickly, and this happened over several days' time, then what we have here, this could easily be explained if the rocks hadn't become rigid yet, hadn't dried out and, and were still pliable or plastic. The word plastic means it could be bent. And so while it's still not dry, it hasn't set like concrete. If, if concrete hasn't set, you can still form it, shape it. But once it sets, you can't, you can't form it anymore. And our problem here is if we have a flood occurring quickly, this can happen. This could bend the rocks, but the flood model will show how the rocks could be bent with no problem. But the atheist uniformitarian position won't explain it, can't explain it. Again, their failure to explain doesn't mean that my position is right. I understand that logically. We have another situation where part of it can be eroded off and they will call that erosion, okay? And uh, of course, a flood would do that as well. We could get that. We could also get renewed deposition on top of this. And of course, the flood, my flood model will explain that as well. But again, the deforming of the rocks up here just won't be explained very well by, by uh, the atheistic position. Just can't explain it very well. I don't know of any explanation they've come up with. They use a word and uh, it's called a read, R-H-E-I-D, reedity, and that's from a Greek word, which uh, means to actually something to be bent. But what we have here is uh, they claim if we put forces to rocks and apply them for millions of years, they'll bend slowly and won't shatter. But of course, the problem with this is they can't test this in the lab because they can't apply force for a million years in the lab. Okay. And so they theorize that this will bend if you do it over a million years of time, you get enough time. Enough time will cure all their problems. That's their theory. They cure everything they want, including organic macroevolution. Of course, normally we'd layer, put layers, normal layers, uh, but uh, we have bent rocks like we have down here. I got this off a couple of geology websites. So they do bend like this. This is a problem. I believe it's a problem for the atheist, not a problem for my model at all. Right here is a picture of bent rocks. See the rocks here that are bent going up like this, and they're bent very sharply. So those go up here and down, and they're bent. Now, how did those rocks get bent? They weren't, if you were putting sediment into a lake, it won't go like this at an angle. It'll go flat. It'll go across. Sediment will settle level. And but this is going up and down. So what's happening here? And my conclusion is that this happened during the flood. And this rock was still pliable. It hadn't solidified yet. And this was uplifted. And I'll, my mechanism, I'll show the mechanism for the uplifting later. It will uplift it and bend that rock while it's still plastic or pliable. And so we don't have a problem here. Also, we have layers that are tilted up, up and down like this layers. And of course, we need to be able to explain that as well with our model. And I believe my model will later on. We'll go into that and show it. If you have any questions along the way, just stop and ask me. Okay? All right, we have this layer up here of rock. It's on top of that, see? Notice how it's layered like this. And again, if you were, if this were like this and sediment was settling, it would, it would fill in this right here and have a big batch of sediment here, and then it would uh, level off. It would fill in that gap down at the bottom. That's how it would work. If you ever watch water flow into a stream, you'll see it. It'll go down to the bottom first, fill the bottom up. So it would have, it wouldn't have put sediment up here. It would have settled out on the bottom again. But if, if we have the rock pliable and it's bent while it's still pliable, this could happen very easily. That could happen very easily. 
again, they've got to bend the rocks. And, and now here's unconformity. This volcanic uh, uh, matter, particulate, coming from volcanoes, and like ash and stuff. And what it does, uh, pieces of rock, volcanic rock, and we see the layers here, they're, they're layered like this. And then we have another batch of volcanic material coming down that layers like this. That does happen. And so we can see that in places like Mount St. Helens and other places. Remember, there's two kinds of volcanoes we talked about, I think, last week, last lesson. Let's look at the missing strata. This is in Missouri, the state of Missouri in the United States. This is dolomite. This is a rock called no supposedly 500 million years old. Down here is rhyolite, and it's 1.5 billion years old. That's 1,500 uh, 1, million years old, what that is. Now, the reason I say that is some countries use the word billion in a different way than we do in the United States. And this is the Tom Sock hydroelectric plant, okay? So right here now, we've got a billion years, a thousand million years of rock that's missing. Where did that 1,000 million, 1 billion years of rock go? It's missing. That's a very interesting question, I think. I think it's a problem for them, but it's no problem for me because they're not that old. Right? These rock were deposited during the flood. We have periods, uh, geologic periods, they named them Tertiary, Cretaceous, Jurassic, Jurassic, Permian, Mississippian, uh, Pennsylvanian, Mississippian, Devonian, Silurian, Ordovician, and Cambrian, and there's Precambrian down here. So if you notice here, they're, they're, this is right off one of their websites now. If you look at this right here, you'll see it goes from simple to complex animals. Remember, this fellow was, was uh, ridiculed him for uh, taking that position from simple to complex. Well, their whole system claims simple to complex. Uh, organic microevolution claims that. And so uh, he's, he's, uh, he's made a claim there about something and ridiculed it, but that's exactly what they claim. And so he's, uh, he's not even really being honorable or, or fair in his rejection of, of the uh, creation arguments. Now we're going to look at this table here. Supposedly, the tertiary period began at 65 million years ago and ended at 1.2 million years ago, one and a half. Cretaceous period supposedly started at 140 million years ago and ended at 65. These are just millions of years over here when they're supposed to have occurred. And so kind of keep that in mind. Now, how do they date these times? They date them by the fossils that are in them. And so they, this, these fossils here are in the Jurassic period, Jurassic is these first dinosaurs and so forth. So all of these are dated by the fossils. They're not dated by the rocks. They're dated by the fossils. Keep that in mind. There'll be sandstone in several of the periods and so uh, shale or other stuff, but they'll date them by the fossils that are in the rock. So the rocks are dated by the fossils. And so that's how they date them, okay? Now our problem is we got inverted strata. Now let's look back up here. There's a sequence from the Precambrian, Cambrian, up all the way up through the tertiary into our modern period, a quaternary period, that's the period we're in right now. And so, that's the period we're in right up here now. It started one and a half million years ago. And so we have here tertiary, Cretaceous, Jurassic, and uh, Triassic, Permian, and so forth. Notice the time sequence, the sequence of these uh, events, of these rocks, of these, these uh, uh, supposed life, and uh, we have the geologic column in the geologic column in the rocks. Now in, in northern, northwest China, there is a, a uh, strata that's inverted, it's upside down. What we have, we have the Pleiocene, and it's uh, 505 million years old, and it's on top. Now, what's, what we have here, uh, we have 5.1 million here. And so 
the the 5.1 million year old rock is on the bottom, and 500 the 505 million year old rock is on top. That just won't work. <laughs> That's a problem. Now, what do they say? How do they say? Well, the, this rock slid over top of the other rock. But you got thousands of feet of rock sliding over top of other rock. It'll act like a bulldozer. That just won't work. It takes tremendous forces to move up ma massive amounts of rock like that. Oh, in the Montana, Lewis Overthrust region, Montana, with the Precambrian is over the Cretaceous. Now, let's look back here. Let's see here. Precambrian is way down here at the bottom, and it's over the Cretaceous way up here. This 500 plus million year old rock is 570 million year old or older rock is on top of the of the Cretaceous between 65 and 140 million. Let's call it a hundred million year old rock. So it's got 400 million years at least of time. And it's older by at least 400 million years, and it's on top. And it shouldn't work that way. It should not happen that way. And so uh, that's one of their basic rules. The old rock is on bottom, the young rock is on top, except here and all of these places. The Franklin Mountains near El Paso in the state of Texas and the United States at West Crazy Cat Canyon, the Lavonican Dodson, is over the Cretaceous. So let's look at it now. That's uh, the wrong, the 130 million year old rock is on the bottom of the 450. Uh, uh, so right here we have this right here. This rock down here is on top of the Cretaceous way up here. This rock is on top of the Cretaceous. Won't work, got a problem. Besides all that, where's the only other rock between it? Where's all the other rocks between it? See, not only that, but you see, you got a gap in it. And the glass overthrust in Switzerland, we have the Permian, Jurassic, and Eocene in that order, right? Now, the Permian, Jurassic, and Eocene, let's look at it now. Permian, Permian is. Uh, let me get my stuff right here. Jurassic and Eocene. Permian, Jurassic, and Eocene. Permian is on top. Jurassic and Eocene is in this tertiary period right in here. It's in that period up here. So we got this is on top. This is in the middle. This is on the bottom. Now this should be in the middle. This should be on the bottom. This should be on top. According to their column. Again, they're reversed. Columns backwards. That doesn't work. Got a problem with it. All right. In the Empire Mountains in southern Arizona, United States, the Permian is over the Cretaceous. All right. Let's go back. The Permian is over the U U Cretaceous. So the Permian down here, this rock, is over the Cretaceous up here. And again, they're going by their fossils that are in it. All right. So with Permian, this is on top and this is on bottom. Something rotten and rotten here. And the Alps, Mythian Peak, Cretaceous is over the Eocene. All right, let's put it up here. Cretaceous is over the Eocene. The Eocene is right up in here. So this Eocene is in this right here. It's in this region, in this period. And uh, so it's here. You'd have to study that more. It's about about uh, probably about 50 million years ago, according to their dating, the Eocene. So this is on top. This is on bottom. Again, you got something backwards. We have a problem here now. So this whole thing, I'll keep coming back to this little chart that you see their chart. But again, Hart Mountain in Wyoming, United States of America, in the state of Wyoming, we have the Jurassic, Tertiary, and Paleozoic. It's supposed to be Tertiary, Jurassic, Paleozoic. But notice we have the Paleozoic, we have Jurassic, Tertiary, and they have more Paleozoic. So we have these two in between this and right here. So it should be Tertiary first, Jurassic, and then Paleozoic. Let's look at it. 
should be what now? Should be tertiary Jurassic Paleozoic. Tertiary. Tertiary. Okay, hold it right here. Tertiary Jurassic. Tertiary is right in here. And Jurassic and uh, and uh, Ozoic. Now, what we have here is they're out of order. Here's in the Alps. Uh, we have the Eocene and uh, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. It's supposed to be. Now, the Eocene is is about 56 to 33.9 million years ago, according to their dating, and. Uh, and we have Eocene, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. It should be Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, Eocene. Now, what we have here is the Eocene. I've got this. This is on this is bottom. This is the lower. This is uh, the second. This is the third. This is the top. And so I've got them kind of arranged in that arrangement right there. So it should be the Triassic should be on bottom. And then Jurassic. Let's look. Jurassic, Jurassic. And then Jurassic, and then what we have? We had Cretaceous and Eocene. So we had Jurassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. Eocene is in the tertiary period. So let's go back and look at the time of the Eocene. It's from 56 to 33.9 million years, according to the, the books I've consulted. So that's right in here, about 33 to 56 million years, right in there is where it's supposed to be. Again, the whole thing is just upside down. That one's just completely upside down. That's in the Alps of the Matterhorn. Are there questions, comments? Now, Ordway, and this is the book I cite, uh, he talks about erosion of canyons and uh, streams, he says, perform most of the work. Now, this is quoted in my book, so you can get the quote, you have the book. Electronic copy, that is. Streams perform most of their work of erosion, transportation, deposition during floods. So it's normal flow of a stream doesn't cut the rock. It takes a flood to cut the rock. Here's the reason why. There'll be small particles like sand that'll settle to the bottom of a stream. If it's not running very, very uh, fierce, that, that, that sediment will settle to the bottom and it won't go across the rock and cut through the rocks. That's what he's telling you, and that's that's the case. So right here, we have streams perform most of their work of erosion, transportation, deposition during floods. In fact, in a few days of pow a powerful flood, a river may accomplish more in the, these respects than it does during the rest of the year, perhaps even for several years. Some large rivers have been known to deepen their channels more than 100 feet. That's 30.5 meters when waters are exceptionally high. Such large rivers flow over upon unconsolidated sediments. See, the sediments in the bottom keep it from cutting to the bedrock. They bury the bedrock floors of their valleys and they can erode the bedrock only during floods. Once they move that sediment away, then they can start cutting to the rock. Only then. So keep that in mind. That's on page 101 of his of his book. All right. Now, so the cutting of canyons is very important. It needs a flood to cut the canyons. Now we're not necessarily talking about the floods like the, we had in the in the Genesis six or nine, but that certainly would cut canyons awfully quickly. The term fossil. Let's talk about what a fossil is. According to Smith, this is a geology book. The term fossil des designates any trace of past life. That's a fossil. Any trace of past life. It could be a, a, a footprint, a, a skeleton, or whatever it might be. Now, Merriam-Webster defines it as a remnant, an impression, or trace of an organism of past geologic ages that has been preserved in the Earth's crust. That's what the, how they define it. Pretty much the same definition. And Smith goes ahead and says the term fossil designates any trace of past life. And that's, of course, what we have at the top, 363. Okay. Now, most fossils are formed beneath shallow water, according to Stokes, it's the geologist, where sediments are being deposited rapidly and continually over long periods of time. Now, here's the problem. 
if you get a fish that dies in a, in a lake, if it lays on the bottom of that lake, there are certain scavengers that will eat that whole fish. They'll just eat it. There are animals that are scavengers. Something dies, it will be eaten up. I'm told that if an animal dies in the ocean, it will never reach the bottom of the ocean floor because scavengers will eat it before it gets to the bottom. And that very rarely does things get to the bottom of the ocean floor. It just doesn't happen very often because they're eaten by by other animals as they as they go downward. Fossilization, according to Hapgood, uh, this is a pretty good book. I like it. Even under the most favorable conditions, is a rare accident. I believe that's true. It has to be rare. It's a rare accident. Okay. So it requires special conditions to preserve a fossil. Conditions have to be just right to preserve a fossil. Keep that in mind. Body fossils of animals and plants nearly always consist only of the skeletonized or toughened parts because the soft tissue are destroyed by microbial decay or scavengers. I believe that's true. Even the hard parts may become so bored, that is a hole bored through it, by organisms such as sponges, fungi, and, uh, and algae, that they are open to destruction. Many fossil plants and some animals are known only as fragments, and it may be difficult to determine which elements belong together. They all, this often leads to a multiplicity of names for different parts of what may turn out to be the same species. So they look at these fossils and they have to figure out what it is. Is this a stem of a plant? Is it, is a, is it part of an animal? Or what is it? And what part is it? Now, Smith goes on and says, catastrophic burial by a rapid influx of sediment is necessary to preserve delicate epiphyllal organisms. The epiphyllal organisms are on the surface here, and so epi is a bone. And, uh, and so what we have is we have epiphyllal organisms. So it takes catastrophic burial. That sounds like a flood to me. Field observations have shown that modern crinoids, sea lilies and feather stars, for example, disarticulate, that is, they break up into pieces within a few days of death. Rapid burial prevents this and thus invoked to explain the number of fossil starfish beds where delicate starfish and brittle stars are preserved. How do you get all these starfish in the, in the sediment? You got to bury them quickly and you got to bury them thoroughly. And it's got to happen quickly because they'll break apart and float apart and uh, they'll be gone. This articulates within a few days. With continued sedimentation, Smith goes on and says, continued sediment, the overburden increases. Now, here's what happens. If you get more sediment, it's the weight of that sediment is, is a burden. Overburden, it increases, it gets heavier. Water is driven out of the sediment. It's like water going out of a sponge if you put pressure on it. And so water is driven out of the sediment surrounding the faucet, compaction takes place. So when the water leaves, there's a gap and that fossil then crushes into that, that place where the water was. The degree of compaction varies, but is greatest in shales in which delicate shells may be severely crushed. So many of these things are crushed. Experiments with spheres of different composition embedded in different matrices to simulate the flattening of fossil plant spores has shown that a variety of artifacts that might be mistaken for original features could be produced by compaction. So once it gets compacted, it, you, don't, you don't know for sure what it looked like when it was in its normal form. And it can, compaction can make it look different. And that's a, that's a problem. Smith on page 363, we just noted, is admitting that the compaction of a fossil might cause a paleontologist, that's a fellow who studies fossils, to mistake the original features of the organism. That's, that's what he tells us here. They can, they can mistake it. How can they know what an organism looked like if all or at least most of the soft parts are destroyed? They're just guessing. They're shooting in the dark. Some of the pictures in the geology books are nothing more than the fertile imagination of the paleontologist. 
they'll take a few little things, a few bones, and then they'll construct a whole animal from it. And it's all imaginary. Imaginary. It's fairy tale. A bunch of it is. Now, I grant you, what they'll probably look at is the present animals we have and make it look a lot like them. But they try to make it look a little different than the present animals we have. I think a lot of the fossils that we're seeing are probably animals we still have today. They're just compacted, or they might have been larger in size in the pre-flood world. The very nature of the destruction of Genesis 6 through 9 provides an excellent mechanism to deposit and preserve fossils. It's a good way to deposit the recover fossils. We have rocks that have one fossil right after another in them. They had to be deposited quickly or those fossils have been eaten. You say, what if it gets buried? There are animals that burrow into the, into the bottom of a lake and eat what's in that sediment. There are burrowing animals that go down into there and worms and other stuff that go down and eat it. And they eat what's in that sediment. And uh, we'll look at those later, but what they do, burrow down and, and get things in the sediment. So it's got to be covered up and compacted pretty quickly. Uniformitarianism does not provide a suitable mechanism to deposit and preserve fossils. Slow changes doesn't do it. it. Takes quick changes. Fossils must be deposited and covered rapidly because of scavengers and decay both. Both of them will get it. Hapgood writes here very interestingly. However, the greatest surprise of recent oceanographic exploration has been the discovery that this supposed thick layer of sediment, uh, what he's talking about is since the earth has been here four and a half or five billion years, there ought to be a lot of sediment on the ocean floor. And that's what they thought originally. They just, they theorized got to be a lot of sediment there. And lo and behold, it was a surprise when they drilled into the sediment, the ocean floor, and they found the thick layer of sediment is non-existent, just not there. The layer of sediment on the ocean floor is uneven. In some places, only a few feet or a few inches thick, and it's rarely of great thickness. There should be a lot more sediment. That's a problem for the atheists, just like the bent rocks were a problem. The apparent youthfulness of the entire, this is not in Prothero now, apparent youthfulness of the entire present deep sea seafloors came as a great shock. They were shocks, he says, for as we argued in chapter six, Basaltic ocean crust is chemically more primitive than granitic continental crust. So the crust on the ocean is older, it's more primitive than granite in the, on the continental crust. Now we discover that not only do the continents apparently contain the only record older than 200 million years, but also that there is a lot of less deep sea sediments than what we expected after such long erosion of continents. Now we're going to get into the erosion of continents as a problem for the atheists. I'm going, to, I'm going to point out one problem after another for them. The evidence forces us to think that both deep sea sediments and oceans have been removed over the eons of time. So he said, now we can't accept the idea that the earth's not billions of years old. So we know the sediment's been there. Something had to happen to it. It's been removed. Something removed it. So it's been removed. We got a problem here. Here's the problem. If the basaltic ocean crust is chemically more primitive than granitic continental crust, then it should be older. Ah, but they say it's not older. Basaltic crust is chemically more primitive than granitic continental crust, according to their claim. Therefore, it should be older. How can it be recycled by subduction? How can it be recycled? And they claim it's by subduction. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we'll show a problem with this, with the subduction. If the earth is billions of years old, then there should be extensive amounts of sediment on the ocean floors. And they were surprised and shocked, he said, that they didn't find it. Say they expected it to be there, and it wasn't. Their theory said it should be there. So they had to come up with a way to explain why it wasn't there once they found it wasn't there. There are not extensive amounts of sediment on the ocean floors. That's a given. They've, they've already checked that. They, they, that's, that's not a question. That's, that's a fact. The earth, therefore, my claim is not billions of years old. Now, how do they answer it? Well, the atheists, all geologists, atheistic geologists cannot accept this. 
because he has to have a billion year old earth to, to get enough time for his organic microevolution as as uh, as geology to to fit. He can't accept the flood and creation. See, that's a problem. See, now if the earth is billions of years old, we're going to take his basic premise now. See his conclusion now. The earth's not billions of years old, so we're going to take this. We'll take this first premise here. We're going to work it again. If the Earth is billions of years old and the sediment has not been removed, okay, then there should be extensive amounts of sediment on the ocean floors. So if if it's that old and the sediment hasn't been removed, it should be there. That's what we're saying. Now that's that's clear. There are not extensive amounts of sediments on the ocean floors. So we only got two alternatives. So the conclusion is the Earth is either not billions of years old or the sediment has, has, has been removed. Now I applied De Morgan's theorem to that primary, that first premise is what I did. And so we negated both uh, and made it a, a disjunction instead of a conjunction, say. All right. So the conjunction and was changed to an or with De Morgan's theorem. So the Earth is either not billions of years old or the sediment has been removed. So, of course, they, they take the position, of course. First alternative, Earth is either not billions of years old or the sediment has been removed. And, of course, the geologist asserts the Earth is billions of years old. He's begging the question. He's assuming the question. Now, he's got to have to prove that with some other, something else. Of course, when it's all said and done, they run to radiometric dating. We'll get to that later. But uh, they don't have any other way to de deal with it. They go to radiometric dating. And we'll talk about that later. The conclusion is the sediment has been removed, allegedly by subduction. Of course, they're begging the question here is what they're doing. They're assuming what they're trying to prove. Now then, they have to prove this because their whole system falls apart if they don't. They got all these problems. And we're going to show other problems they still have, even if they were to prove it's that old. They got other problems. So we have here now, they're begging the question. The Earth's billions of years old. Begging the question. They're assuming that. Now, of course, they claim they prove it by radiometric dating, but we'll, we'll deal with that later. Here is subduction, supposedly, and I believe, there, I believe in te plate tectonics. I believe it does occur. I'm not denying that. Supposedly, this runs underneath another. It's called a subduction. Though sub means below or under. Uh, I think sub is Latin. I know it's not Greek, but hupo would be Greek. But right here, we have here the uh, crust of the of the ocean crust sliding underneath the underneath the crust of a continent. And of course, then that supposedly makes volcanoes occur and so forth. And so this is how the rock is recycled. But this rock is primitive. It's it's old, it's supposed to be old. And so our problem is now we got a problem with that. And of course, we don't have all this sediment on that rock to be going underneath there anyhow. So they're claiming it's recycled and it gets burned up and melted and it comes up through volcanoes and other things. That's what they're claiming here. We won't talk about all of this here, but that's that's a, depicts subduction, what it's all about. Okay, I believe subduction does occur, but I don't think it's a major factor. And we'll explain how it occurs from the flood model. Okay, later. In the present ocean, most burial of organic matter occurs in rapidly deposited near shore sediments or deltas of deltas, shelves, estuaries. That's where a, a stream runs into an ocean, et cetera. Burial occurs under normal marine conditions, which means in oxygenated bottom waters. So it's water that has oxygen. We're bioturbating benthic organisms. Now these are organisms that get into the into the of the sediment, get down into the sediment and dig around in it where they live. The direct proportionality between marine oxygen, organic carbon burial. And total sedimentation rate should not have been affected by change in atmospheric O2 levels in the geologic past, according to Berner and Canfield. So what we have here is these benthic organisms that the organisms that dig into the sediment, 
that they should uh, been able to eat up most of your stuff that got uh, fossilized, but they didn't. So that happened. Now, Judson talks about the rate of erosion and the age of continents here. This is the problem. It's another problem for the for the uh, atheist. Whether we use the rate of erosion prevailing before or after man's advent, our figures pose the problem of why our continents have survived. So he said, we've got a problem. We can't figure out how our continents have survived. Because we're stuck with this four billion year old Earth and a four and a half billion year old Earth. And we can't explain how these continents are still here. Uh, if we accept the rate of sediment production as 10 to the 10th, and that's a one with 10 zeros after it, metric tons per year, the pre-human intervention figure, then the uh, continents are being lowered at a rate of 2.4 centimeters per thousand years. So that's uh, 2.54 centimeters is an inch. That's just slightly less than one inch every thousand years. At this rate, the ocean basins within the volume of 1.37 times 10 to the 18th, that's 1.37. Take your period in this right here and move it 18 places to the right, put, put in there 16 zeros after the seven on the right. That's what you're dealing with, cubic meters. Uh, would be filled in 340 million years. So in 340 million years, we'd have filled the ocean basins and they're certainly not full. We got a problem. Problem here, number one, got a problem, okay? I say it's a major problem to me. I don't see how they can answer it. Never seen a, a reasonable answer. The geologic direct indicates that this has never happened in the past, never has happened. And there is no reason to believe it will happen in the geologic foreseeable future. Furthermore, at the present rate of erosion, the continents, which now average 870 meters, now remember a meter is about 3.28 feet. Uh, it's 13.37 inches uh, in elevation would be reduced to close to sea level in about 34 million years. So in 34 million years, we should have had the continents eroded to sea level and they're not. Could it be that the continents aren't 34 million years old? I say they're not. That's a problem for the atheist. They got a major problem here. Number 55 or where out of them, the number them. They got so many major problems. Kennedy, and this is a geology book also. The fourth problem, that of the long, these are problems having to do with geology, geologic problem, problems that geologists run into. The fourth problem, he listed a bunch of problems, that of the long lifetime of continents and the mountain ranges is perhaps the most difficult of all. The rivers of the world strip tremendous quantities of rock debris, debris off the continents each year deposited in the oceans. The great rivers are steadily wearing down their basins. At this rate, all the land mass of the world would be eroded to sea level to something over order 10 to 25 million years. Now that's not exactly the same figure that was given here by Judson. Judson gave about 34 million years and this fellow gives 10 to 25. Now they're, they're within the ballpark of one another, but uh, what we see is 10, 20, 30, 40 million years should be down to sea level and it's not. So what, what we're saying here is if he, Kennedy's right, we should have already had that uh, 20 million years ago, we should have had uh, all the mountains gone. They should have been gone, right? but they're not, got a problem. Atheist has a problem. I don't have a problem with my flood model. Now, Wilson wrote, it is shown that the rate of erosion and deposition is such that it should have given rise to great shelves about, about the continents at, in past times. So that sediment should have gone out and formed a shelf out in the out, oh, on the edges of the continents, continental shelves, they call them. The shelves that survive are inadequate. They're just not sufficient. So that it can be argued that oral genesis, now that's a fancy word for those that have studied Greek, oros is mountain and genesis or genesis is uh, beginning. So we have the beginning of mountains has generally occurred in and destroyed former marginal uh, shells and caused the growth of the continental blocks, according to Wilson. All right. Now, let's look here 
the fossilization of both plants and animals, it got another effect. This is an effect on the post diluvian organisms, all of them. The fossilization of both plants and animals would greatly reduce the chemical building blocks for plants and animals available for life. For instance, right now, in the rainforest of the Amazon rainforest, uh, what's happening is uh, those trees, they draw up almost all the nutrients from the soil. The soil at the bottom of the rainforest is very, very, very extremely poor soil because nearly all the nutrients are up in the trees. And uh, when they're cutting the trees down and selling them, and all those nutrients are leaving, and the soil that's left is almost non-productive. It's a, it's, it's a terrible situation that's going on there right now. And uh, they need to stop it, otherwise they're, they're gonna have troubles with it. The fossils of animals up in those trees, those nutrients are taken out by the trees and held up in the stems of the trees and the trunks and the limbs and the leaves. Most of the nutrients are up there. There's not much, many nutrients down in the, on the soil down below the trees in the rainforest. So if all of that, those nutrients were in the living organisms and they're deposited in the rocks, they're not available for us to use anymore. That's going to change the nutrients, the nutritiousness of the soil, the ability to sustain life and keep it healthy. When God created the earth, I contend it probably had a fairly even distribution of minerals and elements on all the surface so that plants and animals would grow well, be healthy. The plants would have been created so as to make an optimal usage of the minerals and elements in the soil that God created. Now, that makes perfectly good sense. The modern science and nutrition has proven that plants and animals and, and man need certain optimum distribution of elements and minerals. If you know anything about fertilizing soil, you know, for instance, if you don't have enough copper in your soil, uh, your wheat will turn yellow instead of green and it won't be it won't be healthy. So the wheat has to have that copper. That's just one example. There's other elements that it needs as well besides copper. Anything less than this optimum, however, will cause diseases, stunted growth and shorter life expectancy for many uh, among many other factors. In other words, the plants and animals that the particular animals that eat those plants won't be as healthy as uh, as they would have been if they had nutritious soil to, for the plants to grow in. The fact that the soil is deficient in certain elements can contribute to reduced growth of plants, animals, and even humans thereby. Okay. There are certain rare minerals uh, such, such as boron and other minerals that have, have been depleted from the topsoil by erosion of the plant minerals to the oceans and by, by, the, flood, by the flood itself. What we have is, the, if the minerals were evenly distributed, if the flood was a tidal flood which rotates, it would act like the centrifuge and separate out the minerals. We'd have various minerals separated in ores like in veins, veins of copper, veins of gold and other stuff. A uh, little bit of gold, a little bit of silver is good for you in your diet. Uh, we don't want too much, but a little bit is good. We need all of these elements, boron and stuff like this, to make us healthy. We need the right a proportion of them. Too much is not good, not enough is not good, just the right amount. Uh, it's like uh, the three bears, Goldilocks and the three bears. This is just right. There is a patty that's just right. This particularly occurs, we got a problem now. There was a conference at Rio several years ago, the United Nations conference, about the soil. And they were discussing the fact that a lot of your water soluble minerals, uh, when it rains, the, the water will, they'll, the mineral will become soluble in the water. And then when the water goes into the ground, that mineral will be pulled deeper into the ground. Now that, that works okay if you just have trees that pull it back out and put it back up. But uh, what we have is a large portion of the earth doesn't have deep rooted trees in it. It has grasslands and other places. 
And so these minerals that are water soluble, and some of those are essential to healthy organisms, uh, are then pulled deeper into the ocean or wind up in the, in the oceans or in the river basins or go deep into the soil as the water sinks into the ground and gets where the plants can't reach it. And of course, that's the soil is less nutritious. And the conference at Rio was concerned about this. But what I found is when I looked at that conference at Rio, they were saying this is happening very rapidly. And I thought, well, how rapid is it? Is it rapid enough that in a thousand years we're not going to have have a good soil? The soil has been good. actually, I, I think since the flood has been going downhill and getting less nutritious for animals and plants. Removal of these elements by leaching, it's called re leaching, when it soaks and it absorbs, the water absorbs it and pulls it down with it, depletes the soil of these elements and lowers the fertility of the soil. So that happens. This is a problem and they're recognizing it. They actually recognize it. The conference at Rio, I think the Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil. If there's no rainfall in the antediluvian environment, which I don't believe there was, but the earth was watered by heavy dew, this leaching would have been almost non-existent before the flood. Would not have been a problem before the flood. But it is a problem now since we have rainfall. If there, here's another problem for the atheist. If there's an ideal soil for plant growth, the right nutrients in it, there must have been the soil that existed prior to the flood, according to my model. The atheist cannot explain why plants adapted to this ideal soil rather than to the soil in which they evolved. I think it's a problem for the atheist. The soil should have adapted if organic macroevolution occurs to whatever the plants should have adapted by evolution to the soil that they that they found themselves in, rather than adapting to a, an ideal soil that didn't exist. Uh huh. However, if God created for this ideal soil before the flood, it makes perfectly good sense. We can explain it. How can the atheist say that the soil is constantly changing its constituent parts and the plants evolve by adaptation to a soil of a different constituency? That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. This closes our lesson here. And uh, I will ask, are there any questions by those in the class? Questions? All right.